SLPs work in the NICU? Did you know that speech language pathologists have a critical role in the neonatal intensive care unit or the NICU? This is an exciting and often difficult area for SLPs to tap into. But what exactly are our roles in this setting? Let's dive into some of the basics of our roles and what we should know when it comes to working in the NICU as an SLP. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. According to ASHA's position statement on SLPs practicing in the NICU, 2004, SLPs must have a fundamental competency with feeding and swallowing in premature and full-term infants. It is imperative that SLPs in the NICU have the knowledge and background in typical infant development, physiology, genetics, atypical infant development, and supportive care. Having an understanding of medical conditions that may occur in the NICU is an essential skill when providing feeding therapy in the NICU. A skilled SLP with specific training in NICU care will be able to distinguish medical condition limitations versus developmental feeding impairments versus disordered feeding practices. Common medical conditions in the NICU include bronchopulmonary dysplasia, intraventricular hemorrhage, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, tracheoesophageal fistula, and necrotizing enterocolitis just to list a small handful. There are four levels of NICU care as defined by the American Academy of Pediatrics that the MedSLP should be aware of. Level one, which is also called a special care nursery, is for low risk neonates who are physiologically stable and typically born between 35 and 37 weeks. Level two, moderately at risk neonate who is expected to improve quickly and does not need subspecialty care such as pulmonary, cardiac, or genetics. They're usually born at 32 weeks or above and weigh more than 1,500 grams, or 3.3 pounds at birth. Level three is a moderate to high-risk neonate who is expected to require advanced medical care by specialists who are trained and equipped to care for neonates' medical conditions. They may be born younger than 32 weeks gestational age and weigh less than 1,500 grams at birth. Level four. High-risk neonate who is expected to require the same advanced medical care as a level three NICU, but with capability for surgeries, including complex cardiac procedures, and ability to provide ECMO if needed. Okay, I am so passionate about SLPs getting more exposure and experience and presence in the NICU. My son was in a level three NICU about six years ago and there was no SLP involvement in the NICU. I had to read and learn everything possible about feeding and swallowing, and I even had a lot of experience with this area with adults, but I still felt so lost and confused. I am so happy and grateful to have colleagues now that work solely in the NICU. I've asked so many of them questions about what they would have done, and I'm so happy other mothers in my situation now have the help, support, and knowledge of an SLP during those early feeding days. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't want to miss, so make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. SLPs have a direct role with premature and full-term infants who have feeding and swallowing impairments. SLPs who work in the NICU have a heavy role in supporting infants with feeding and swallowing disorders. Feeding and swallowing disorders might look like difficulty latching onto the nipple, a disorganized suck-swallow pattern, feeding aversion, or trouble accepting oral nutrition. Frequent coughing during meals, anterior bolus loss, or difficulty controlling the bolus or poor respiratory coordination. This can lead to frequent upper respiratory infections, failure to thrive, weight loss, and the need for alternative means of nutrition and hydration through a feeding tube. So what can SLPs do to help? First and foremost, SLPs must conduct a thorough chart review, understand the medical history, interview the parents, collect more information from the nurses, and assess the infant's feeding and swallowing. As with adults, we need to determine what's actually happening and why. SLPs can conduct a modified barium swallow study with an infant. This also takes specialized training as the anatomy of an infant is different from that of an adult. You might be a pro at doing video fluoroscopy with adults, but expect to adjust your expectations and allow time to observe and learn the anatomy and swallow physiology of an infant and how that will show up under fluoroscopy. While SLPs can come up with an exercise plan for adults with dysphagia, that's not the case for infants. During our feeding and swallow assessments, we have several questions to ask ourselves. 
How does positioning impact the infant's feeding and airway protection? Does a different nipple, like a slow flow nipple, make a difference? What about pacing techniques? The SLP isn't only there to ensure the newborn is protecting their airway during nutritional intake. We also must collaborate with the rest of the care team and look at goals around promoting infant-driven feeding, increasing the child's comfort during and after feedings, and tracking various visual or behavioral signals during feedings that might help communicate the infant's endurance, tolerance, comfort, and overall ability to safely consume oral nutrition. I learned so much about infant-driven feeding when my little man was in the NICU. It's tough because the medical community can be so scientific with measuring grams and ounces and timing of feeding to calculating a baby's nutritional needs, but all of that goes out the window with infants. Infant-driven feeding requires the most patience in the world, and the baby is the boss. If they don't want it or can't handle it due to poor respiratory coordination, then we can't force it. It's important for SLPs to study and learn more about infant-driven feeding as a newer model compared to volume-driven feeding, which can be harmful to a baby's neurological development. As I learned more about infant-driven feeding, I became much more comfortable reading his cues and allowing him to progress on his own terms. SLPs have a role in training and supporting parents in feeding techniques and other considerations related to their child's oral intake. We're not there just to be hands-on with the child and feeding equipment. According to ASHA, SLPs need to have foundational knowledge in the following areas when it comes to training and counseling parents in the NICU. They need to have knowledge of principles of instruction, counseling principles, prenatal to postnatal continuities relative to communication, cognition, feeding and swallowing, psychobiology of early learning in the fetus and neonate, cultural values and their impact on professional practice in the NICU, family systems, family dynamics, parent-infant interactions and approaches to family empowerment, developmentally supportive care and family-centered practice, ethical decision-making processes. ASHA also states that SLPs should have the following skills when it comes to training and counseling parents in the NICU. Identify educational and counseling needs of families, other caregivers, and staff. Provide education, counseling, support, and empowerment strategies for families, other caregivers, and staff. Adjust content and delivery in the context of cultural values to the specific needs of the persons being educated, counseled, and supported. Provide education for varied purposes and venues, such as rounds, staffings, and in-service educational programs. Provide advocacy for infants and families. Document education, counseling, and support provided. Evaluate effectiveness of the education, counseling, and support provided. Participate in developmentally supportive care and family-centered practice. Participate in ethical decision-making processes. It's extremely important that SLPs be mindful and respectful of cultural factors surrounding neonatal and perinatal decision-making. The NICU is a stressful environment. No parent wants to leave their child behind in a sterile environment with machines, tubes, needles, and dozens of other people. While the NICU is a life-saving environment and the medical staff is there to protect every child, the stress remains high particularly if there's a lack of trust between the caregivers and medical professionals. As SLPs, we have a role in communicating our findings and supporting the education of the parents we train and counsel. We are there to support them in successfully nourishing their child, and we need to be able to clearly communicate strategies as well as the rationale for those strategies to improve the likelihood of carryover. As I mentioned, we did not have an SLP on our NICU team with our son, but the neonatologist that was caring for him was so incredible. And I think the only person that gave me hope about our situation the entire time. She was very patient and matter of fact, yet incredibly encouraging. And I remember saying to a friend that all SLPs need to have her counseling skills because she navigated us through the most challenging time in our lives. A friend of mine who used to work in the NICU shared a powerful story with me about how her education and support for the parents of these children in the NICU made a profound impact. One mother had experienced a lot of stress and trauma throughout the birth of a premature child, and this led her to questioning everything the nurses and physicians were doing, as well as a lack of trust in the medical team. Taking a person-centered and empathetic approach, my friend took the time to listen to every concern the mother had, validate her feelings, repeat them back to her to make sure she was understanding the mother's concerns correctly, and took the time to type up an easy-to-read handout of every recommendation the reason behind each recommendation, and the goals the providers had. She included her own recommendations from her feeding assessment and allowed increased time for training. Prior to discharging, my friend told this mother that she was doing a great job. The mother started to tear up and gave my friend a hug. 
She told her that she had no idea what was going on. And it wasn't until my friend took the time to explain everything, demonstrate techniques, and listen that she started to trust the process. But what really made her feel relieved and confident was simply hearing those words of affirmation, that she was doing a good job. Our words and our actions are just as important as our recommendations, and taking the time to listen, learn, and provide extra support can make a world of difference. I've got a free gift for you over at metaslpcollective.com. You'll get instant access to our free MetaSLP Collective Pediatric Clipboard Kit, specific to those peds metaslps out there. We also have a robust and vibrant community of SLPs and pediatric mentors to help you out with your toughest clinical cases. Head over to metaslpcollective.com now to get your hands on this. The link will be in the description below.